demonstrating mob grazing impacts in the northern Great Plains on grazing land efficiency, botanical composition, soil quality, and ranch economics is a project funded by the USDA NRCS Conservation Innovation Grants. This project involves a team of faculty from South Dakota State University and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln that are working in close collaboration with mob grazing practitioners from both states. For the subrogated meadows and upland range of the Nebraska Sand Hills region, UNL faculty has the objectives of looking at rangeland productivity and utilization, as well as the botanical composition and the different grazing strategies, including mob grazing. Looking at what is happening with soil carbon sequestration and soil nutrients in this grazing system is also an objective of the project. All of the Nebraska's mob grazing practitioners that collaborate with this project are located in the north central part of the state on the east part of the Nebraska Sandhills. This video features Chad Peterson. His 4,000 acre ranch is located near Newport in Rock County, Nebraska. This is my family's ranch. I um, took it over from my grandma in 96, mostly with the buffalo business to start out with and then um, have transitioned to cattle. The climate in this region is semi-arid with precipitation averaging 25 inches per year, although it can range from 9 to 32 inches per year. Midsummer temperatures average highs of 88 degrees Fahrenheit but can easily reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The meadow and dune soils are sandy to fine sandy loams in the Valentine series. The sandy dune soils have a thinner layer of topsoil containing little organic matter, while sub-irrigated meadow soils have eight or more inches of dark soil rich in organic matter. The ranch only has grasslands. Upland and meadow vegetation is dominated by native warm season and introduced cool season grasses. Big blue stem, switchgrass, prairie cordgrass, quackgrass, and Kentucky bluegrass are commonly found on the ranch. Forbs and sedges are also common on the ranch. Chad Peterson started mob grazing the sub-irrigated meadows in 2001. Chad mob grazes with Highlander cattle with stocking densities from 300,000 to two million pounds per acre. During our visit to Chad Peterson's ranch, we asked Chad what was his primary objective with mob grazing. Uh, maximum profits per acre. I should qualify that with sustainably. Maximum sustainable profit per acre. You know, if you're improving the soil, if you're seeing more diversity, if your water cycle's better, and those kind of things, and you're, and you're still making a profit, that's that's probably the indications you need. That might show up in stocking rate over a long term or total pounds produced or something like that. But is it is it a long term change? I mean, I could I could double my stocking rate in one year, but would that be sustainable? You know, I'll I'll collapse the system uh, a couple years down the road. There's about 800 large in there. Um, that's not calves, but that's two-year-olds and up, spring calving cows and fall calving cows. The spring cows start around April 1st, and the fall cows will start about mid-August. Right now, this uh, 800 head is on right at three acres. Um, so it's a stock density of about 300,000 pounds per acre. Two things that determine my start date. A, is it dry enough to put cattle on the meadow, which is always an issue here. And then, is there really enough volume to, to make it work? So, but you know, average start day, mid-June to mid or mid-May to mid-June. Uh, to get dry enough, and then I can go, I can go in the fall until my water lines freeze up. So mid October maybe. You know, I started out June first, probably going over 25 acres a day, and now I'm down to nine. So it, it varies. 
if if it was a normal year where I had as much left over as, as typical, I wouldn't have gone through 25 when I started out with it. Might have been 15 or, or something. And at the volume we're at now, uh, it'll take nine acres for today. So I moved them at 6:40 this morning. It's now whatever it is, eight something. Um, I'll move them again late morning, like 11, 10:30 or 11, and then they'll get moved again, probably in the evening sometime, sometime between 6 and 8, I'll move them a third time. Um, yeah, I don't go by the clock so much. I pretty much let the cattle tell me what and when to move. You're always adjusting to the last screw up. You don't know if you moved them too soon until you waited too long. You don't know if you waited too long until you moved them too soon. I walk though, like when I take up a fence, I just reel it up and I walk. Um, I try to just get as much of that area so that it's a real calm walking to the next break. What's, what's some of the things you noticed about the grass? Uh, well, more diversity for sure. You know, um, I found, like, is if, if you want, you can walk out in front or in the other side when we get over there. There's a lot of Maximilian sunflowers. Um, last week I found the first, uh, and there's probably some experts here that can tell me, but in the book it's a sawtooth sunflower. It's the first one I've ever seen actually in a pasture. And you don't see the Maximilian sunflowers in anybody's pasture here. You might find them in road ditches, but you won't find them in a pasture. You won't find them in a hay meadow. You might find them in a fence line where the mower bar didn't get it, but I have them growing out in the everywhere um, so I think the diversity has really gone up I'm kind of excited to find out what the next couple years of data shows because uh, my hypothesis like last year this year is the hay meadows were actually probably better off because the litter I've been putting down hasn't been cycling because it's so wet so if you didn't put it down I I mean, I've got mats where, I mean, the plant spacing has thinned because there's so much litter. Um, whereas if I would have hate that, I probably wouldn't have affected plant spacings so much. So the challenge right now is getting that litter broke down. Because in, in spots, I mean, it's thick. Not everywhere, but it's there's places where the stand is very thin because of so much litter. And haven't, if I'd hate that, it wouldn't have happened. In 2012, University of Nebraska faculty started a demonstration site at Chad Peterson's ranch. Three management strategies, including mob grazing, hay, and conventional grazing, were selected for this demonstration. On each strategy, three transects were delineated to annually record botanical composition of the pastures, biomass productivity, and soil organic matter. The botanical composition of the meadow pastures was measured using modified step point technique. In 2013, a larger number of grass and forb species were found in the conventional grazing pastures compared to the hay and mob graze pastures. The area covered by grasses was larger in grazed pastures compared to hay. Biomass productivity was assessed in July of 2012 and 2013. The vegetation from five quadrats per transect was clipped at ground level and sorted into four functional groups. Warm season grasses, cool season grasses, sedges, and forbs, as shown in the figures. During the 2012 drought, the pasture mob grazed for over 10 years had 40% more production than the adjacent hay pasture, and 60% more production than the conventionally grazed pasture. During the 2013 year, recovering from the drought, biomass production was similar between the mob grazed and hay pastures. Soil organic matter was estimated from loss on ignition. Soil samples from 0 to 8 inches in depth were collected in April 2012 from the transects on each pasture. The hay pasture had 15% less soil organic matter compared to the mob grazed pasture. The conventional pasture had lower organic matter content and more sand than the hay or the mob grazed pasture.